Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Woodburn Accountants and Advisors August webinar series, all about setting up a company in China. We're going to look at five different topics this week, all around the key decisions that have to be made as you are establishing your company in China. Today, we're gonna to be looking at the China Incorporation Blueprint, which is an overview of the nine key decisions that have to be made. We will then look further on within the next four sessions, so Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, at what I consider to be the four biggest key, key decisions that have to be made and where a lot of companies and individuals struggle with understanding and obtaining that information. So today we're gonna to get started. As I normally do for all my webinars, I would always like to know who's on. It's August, there are not a lot of people that are on live today. There's just Donna Lynn and Grace um, who have joined previous webinars. So I won't go into too much detail about this. But as I mentioned, it's always nice to know if you are watching this on replay, you know, comment in, in the section when I post the, the, the video on YouTube, are you a newbie, are you a startup or, you, or are you an experienced China hand? It's always nice to know who my audience is and who is actually watching these webinars. Um, how the webinar works is we are using Zoom meeting. This is my first day at, back at work from the, from the summer holidays. Um, and there are quite a few devices on the Wi-Fi right now. And I've had a couple of connection issues this morning already. If I run into any technical issues, please know it does take about 60 seconds to 90 seconds for my system to reboot, and then I will be coming back on and we'll be finishing today's presentation. I understand that if you have to log off for time reasons, um, please do. We are recording today's session, so you will be able to review this again on our YouTube channel later on. Um, if you run into any technical difficulties, just know that the easiest thing to do is log off the system to then log back onto the system. Um, if the problems persist, then just know again, we are recording today's session and you'll be able to view the recording on our YouTube channel. Um, there's a small number of you on today, so I'm not sure how interactive the Q&A will be, but if you do have any questions, any comments, please share them in the chat box. Uh, this is going to be 60 to 90 minutes of your time spent, so use it wisely. And if you do have any questions or you need clarity on something, don't hesitate to ask. Um, your expert for this week, I don't have any guest speakers, is myself. My name is Christina kohler Kaluccia. I'm the head of business advisory at Woodburn Accountants and Advisors. I'm a leading expert on inbound investment into China with officially now 17 years of experience in the corporate services sector um, and the compliance sector in China. Um, we are a company that is headquartered in Hong Kong and we have our subsidiary in Shanghai and our teams are based in both those locations. I've worked with over 500 companies with their inbound investment into the Hong Kong and Chinese market. We have helped with pre-investment advisory, strategy development, as well as then the implementation of those structures together with a focus on growth and scaling up in the Chinese market. The beauty of China over the last 17 years is that a lot of things have become systemized and have been become proper processes so that we've developed certain methodologies around these. In the July webinar series, I looked at each of these methodologies and you can review those webinars up on our YouTube channel. And today I'm gonna to be doing exactly one of those methodologies, which is the China Incorporation Blueprint. And just a note, I've launched a book on Amazon earlier this year called The Nine Superpowers to Succeed in China. If you are at a stage of pre-investment into China and you are looking to get all of your entry uh, processes done correctly, then this book will be a super helpful tool for you. The book provides nine key tools and disciplines that should be followed in order to make sure you avoid the most mundane and common obstacles that arise in the Chinese market. The idea is to create your own journey in China. Every company's journey is different. So it is recommended to read the book in order to understand how to create your action plan, your checklist, and to be able to cross off of those as you move along with your journey into the Chinese market. 
The book can be found on all the Amazon websites. Um, just type in nine superpowers to succeed in China and it will pop up in front of you. It's found on hard copy as well as on the Kindle version. So let's start with part one of this webinar series, which is looking at the China incorporation blueprint. Now, what are the problems for foreign investors when they're thinking about setting up their company in China? There are some very common ones. One is the incorporation process when explained to them sounds absolutely bizarre, particularly in terms of the step-by-step -step procedures and the timeline, that there's so much unfamiliarity and uncertainty about what's being told, whether it's true or not true. Um, and sometimes there are differenti differentiation between pro providers about the timelines and things like that, that it does get very confusing and very difficult to understand what's right and what's wrong, right? People are also confused by the document lists. They're astounded by the amount of documents that are required. Um, and probably for me, points five and six are the most critical. Many corporate service providers in the market don't go through the key considerations that have to be made. In many instances, they fill in those key considerations on behalf of their client without actually informing them of what is being decided. No time and thought process is being taken into those considerations, and sometimes there's absolutely no decision making being done by the actual owners of the business, which can lead to issues later on and more money spent on fixing those issues and time spent as well, which can obviously interrupt your business, um, causing a lot of confusion, anxiety, stress, anger, frustration, et cetera, all right? So one thing that I'm here to avoid is these feelings of frustration and anger and anxiety and stress. So I wanna give people the ability to, be, uh, to have transparency and understand actually how it works, all right? Now, what you hear from me today might be very different from what you hear from other corporate service providers. Again, every corporate service provider actually has their own experience because although the process is systemized, time-wise, it's going to vary tremendously from city to city. It's going to vary from time period to time period. It's gonna also depend a lot on whether the government systems are working. So from a time perspective, there can be a lot of differentiations. But let's just begin with process and timeline, okay? So basically, I've divided the process into two stages. One is the establishment of the actual company, and one is the post-registration steps that have to be taken once you get your business license. So in step one, you are looking at um, drafting all of the application documents, which involves the key decisions that have to be made. In order to draft those documents, what we have is a questionnaire that we ask our clients to complete, which has all of the key decisions that have to be made inside there, whether it's about the registered office address, who the shareholder is going to be, who's going to be in the corporate management, what's the investment capital going to be, what's the term of validity going to be, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's all in this questionnaire. And there has to be advisory provided on this, okay? Because you need to know the ins and outs, pros and cons about all these decisions that are going to be made. You then go through the name approval process, which requires the address and capital information. You're going to do an online declaration prior to submitting the original documents to obtain your business license. Then you issue your chops, and then you do what is called a CA application, which is obtaining a key token that is used that has all of your business registration content within it, and it's used at the government offices to do any changes, etc. Okay. So there are these steps. Then the post-registration is as follows. If you are going to be setting up a company that is in a specific industry that it requires additional licenses, you are going to first of all apply for that license, whether it's a food business license, um, whether it's an NBOCC license because you're gonna be a freight forwarder, whatever it might be. And on average, it does take about 30 working days to apply for those licenses, okay? I put that in orange because it's not applicable to all companies. It depends on what industry and sector you're going into. It depends on the type of business scope that you are going to generate. Business scope is referring to the activities you're actually going to be doing. You then go ahead with the application for the bank account. Once that's done, it's always good to know and make that decision which bank you're going to be working with and start that communication prior to actually establishing the company. You're going to open up your RMB basic account, capital account, 
ideally with one bank, so it's all consolidated. You can do it with different banks, but that will increase the working day timeline, um, obviously, because you're working with two banks. Then. You then do the tax registration, understanding what tax status you're going to have. If you are a service company, that's where it ends at point nine. If you're in trading, manufacturing, you will go on to steps 10, 11, 12, and 13. 10 is the commercial company registration allowing you to do import export. Then you do customs registration. You do foreign exchange registration for import export. And then you do the customs import registration. Now, steps 10 to 13, if you are, uh, uh, sorry, steps 11 to 13, if you're planning to use your freight forwarder to do all the customs clearance for you, then you wouldn't need to do those steps. If you're planning on doing it in house, then you have to do those steps, okay? So the, this is basically the step-by-step -step procedure. This is the systemized process um, that you have to follow one item by one item to get your company established. The working days that are listed there are guidelines purely guidelines. Nobody should ever be telling you that they can guarantee those timelines. There are so many ifs. You have to make sure that the government systems are working. Um, we've just had a case where we set up a company where for two weeks to do the online declaration, we couldn't do it because the Mofcom's website wasn't working, um, which meant a delay by two weeks. It's the fault of the Mofcom that their website wasn't working, something that was unpredicted causing a two week delay. So there are a lot of things here that are out of the control of the service provider, lawyer, agent, whoever you're using to establish the company. Also consider all the careers that have to go back and forth for signatures and original documentation. Um, that can't always be done in a unified package because sometimes things pop up when new signatures are required. So you've got to count, account for that delivery time as well. Um, people might be on business trips or on holidays, in which case you're waiting for signatures. Uh, so there's a lot of things that can pop up that can um, make those working days not applicable, basically. But these are guidelines, assuming that everything is so systematic and following the process by process step. Okay. So that's it. That's the process and the timeline. All right. Now let's look at the document list because the document list is extensive. This is page one of two. There are a lot of documents that are going to be issued. Uh, one thing to keep in mind that the majority of these documents besides the two red ones will be issued from the online declaration that is done in the system. So once the online declaration is approved, these documents are generated from that system where you then have to print them out, sign off on them, okay? and then they are submitted in um, original format. The articles of association are also printed from the system, but can be adapted, which is recommended, to fit your company bylaws and your needs in China. Okay? And obviously they will go through an approval process once you've submitted the originals. Um, passport copies of everybody in the corporate management system, as well as the authorized signatory of the shareholder, and then the last four documents are in relation to the registered office address that you have chosen for your um, property, okay, for your office. So the list is extensive. Um, original signatures have to be made. It is an old fashioned process. Um, you will have a stack of A4 pieces of paper because it's not just one copy that you have to print out. There will be several copies of each document that you have to print out. We do recommend that everything is in English and Chinese so that there are translations so you know what you're signing. And you do have to sign with a black pen, which let me see if I got Yes, <clears throat> so you do have to sign with a pen like this, um, fountain pen type pen, not a ballpoint pen. Uh, it has to be in black in color. If you sign with any other pen, the documents will be rejected. So it is an old fashioned process. There are, um, you know, little things you have to follow and make sure you dictate and, and abide by, otherwise the documents won't be accepted. But did you know that there are key considerations needed to be made for the incorporation? And this is where this whole China Incorporation Blueprint comes into the picture, because I want people to know that your lawyer, your agent, your corporate service provider should not be making those decisions on your behalf. 
okay? These are decisions that you have to make. They are critical to your business. They should be made properly upfront so that ultimately no changes have to occur at a later date, all right? So let's get cracking on the China Incorporation Blueprint. For me, there are four steps that have to be taken into consideration and they sort of lead one into the other. And the first is on the structure, right? What type of entity are you going to set up? What type of activities are you going to be performing in the market? What's the capital that you need to start up your business and pay for your expenses before revenue starts coming in? And what's going to be the term of validity? Step two is the people. Who's the shareholder? Who's in the corporate management? Step three is the location. What's the company name going to be? What's the registered office address? Step four is looking at finance, which is which bank are you going to work with? Which bank is your company going to be working with? What will be the value added tax status, the VAT status? And who is going to be your finance manager? Who's going to be appointed as your finance manager? All right, so let's get cracking on the various steps. So step one is looking at structure. So decision one, has to be around the type of entity you're establishing and the business scope that you need in order to be able to operate properly in the market, all right? There are different types of entities that can be established in China. There's a representative office, a WUFI, FICE, a domestically owned enterprise, joint venture, or an FIP. FIPs are usually for accountancy firms, law firms, where you have a partnership that's generated, okay? Where you have partners within an organization that are coming together. So if you're not an accountancy firm, law firm, the FIP would not apply to you. Um, I have listed here the RO, you know, the WUFI, FI, COE, because this is still to this day, and I, I heard it this morning with a client, um, the terms that are utilized to reference the types of companies that are being established. I really don't like these terms because ultimately, besides the representative office, you're all establishing limited liability companies. Okay, which are LLCs, the types of companies you would establish in Hong Kong or anywhere else in the world, right? It's a limited liability company. Why are these terms about what will be fine, COE? It's because you're looking at who's the shareholder, okay? And the activities that are being performed within the company. So historically, and again, I'm giving you my interpretation, a Wufi is owned by a foreign investor and a Wufi does only service-oriented business and activity. A FICE is a foreign invested commercial enterprise owned by a foreign investor where they do commercial oriented activities like import, export, domestic sales, retail, manufacturing, anything to do with the sale of goods, not service, goods, okay? And the joint venture is obviously a company that's owned by a foreign investor, a Chinese investor, domestically owned enterprises are Chinese investors, okay? The representative office is purely a liaison office, not a limited liability company. It's a liaison office of the shareholding company that's abroad. All right, but ultimately setting up a limited liability company. When you're looking at these types of entities and predominantly what I'm referring to here is making a comparison between a representative office, which is the liaison office with the limited liability companies, Wolfie, Vice, DOE, JV, et cetera is you gotta look at three things, the liability, the flexibility, and the marketability of the type of structure you're setting up, okay? In today's age, most companies are looking to set up limited liability companies because their goal is to generate revenue in China, okay? Um, and they're looking to generate that revenue from day one. Representative offices cannot generate revenue. So why would you set up a representative office? It's because you um, are a marketing office, right? You're purely marketing your products or services. We have a showroom um, and all contracts are gonna be with the head office abroad, okay? When you're looking and comparing these structures, you might say, well, you know, initially I'm just gonna do what the rep office is. I'm just gonna be a liaison office, but you're always gonna do something that goes outside of the scope. So for example, a liaison office should do no negotiation, purely a showroom. Negotiation should still be from the head office. Now, how do you prove that? It's very hard to prove it unless somebody denounces you, okay? So you're always gonna do something that's gonna be a little bit outside of the scope. And from my experience, 
almost all representative offices that I've been in touch with, unless they are really marketing offices, have always been changed into limited liability companies at some point. So you got to look at the liability of the structures you're setting up. You got to look at the flexibility of those structures you're setting up. And what's the marketability? Well, you know, when I say marketability, it's like, what image are you trying to portray in the Chinese market? Are you looking for stability and commitment? Well, go with a limited liability company because that shows you're going to be there for a long time. Who shows? Only set up a rep office. It's, it's a showroom, right? It's a liaison office. How committed are you really to the Chinese market? Okay. So I would look at those three things to make an analysis of what structure would fit you best. And then ultimately, what you need to do is you need to choose your business activity wisely. Okay. The, in China, compared to other jurisdictions, the business scope actually and really does dictate what you are allowed to do in the market. And it offers zero flexibility to go around that. And you can get caught if you do something outside of your scope through the audits that are done at the end of each year. So it is very, and, and also, Prior to that, prior to the audit, if you do something prior to the audit, it's, it's getting denounced by employees, okay. um, which has happened. But denouncing has happened quite often. So it is important to know exactly the type of activities you're going to be performing in the Chinese market, get those registered in your business license, um, and know what you can and cannot do, okay? In China, there's something called the negative list, which um, dictates what companies, foreign investors are not allowed to do in China. So it's important to check that whatever is in your list of activities is not in that negative list. Um, because if it is, you won't be able to perform it. Uh, you will also have to check the list in relation to restricted and prohibited companies, uh, prohibited activities. Um, because again, there you might then be forced to, to have a joint venture versus having your own 100% owned foreign invested company. Okay. The business scope will dictate the type of entity that you're actually establishing in the Chinese market. Okay. So it's important to, again, create a Word document with the bullet points and show what you're going to be doing in the Chinese market. So here are some examples of what these business scopes look like, okay? Um, these are very brief drafts of what they look like. Uh, the first one is an import and export type business scope um, where it says wholesale of the product, import and export and related services. Again, you need to detail the types of products that are going to be imported and exported or sold domestically. The next one is if you're going to be doing e-commerce, then you're gonna add inter internet retail, but then you will have to apply for an ICP license because then you will have your own website and that website has to be registered with an ICP filing or with an ICP license. The next is if you're gonna be doing manufacturing, processing, and the one thereafter is for, for uh, consulting services, basically, okay? Now, when you are doing the online declaration for the company registration, it is a uh, website and you're completing a form. In terms of your business scope, there is now a pull down menu with the activities that are possible in China for 100% owned foreign investors. I mean, there's over a thousand options there. So normally what we do is we take the list from our clients and we type them in, sometimes have to tweak the wording to get the right wording um, that's listed in this list. It's not as it was historically. So these are historical business scopes. Nowadays, it's really just bullet points, wording about the activities. This is why I highly recommend that everyone takes a piece of paper and writes down the products or the services that they're gonna be performing and the activities, whether that's import, export, consulting, accounting, bookkeeping, human resource services, you know, list out everything that you're doing so that you have the ability to give clear insight to your lawyer, your agent, whoever, 
on what needs to be in that business scope. If you don't give that insight and you know, don't expect your lawyer to figure that out for you. You are running your company. You are going into China for a reason. You are the one who knows the activities that you wanna perform in China, right? Now, as I mentioned, representative offices cannot do very much. They are purely liaison offices that cannot generate revenue. All they can do is hire people legally and act as type of showrooms, liaison type activities that are being performed. So if you are looking to generate revenue in China, and even if that revenue is only generated in three, four, five years, I would still recommend going with a limited liability company versus a rep office. So your action plan for decision one is to take a piece of paper, as I said, and write down products, services, activities, but not just for the period now, which is probably what's on the top of your head. But also, what do you foresee? What's your vision of this company? And what do you expect to happen in five years and in 10 years? The next action plan that I would take is I would compare your competitors. The competitors that are already in the market, if they've been established, what are their business scopes? Do you have the ability or do you want to research them and understand what types of business scopes do they have? Now, if they were established 10 years ago, the format of their business scope will be very different from the format that you will have because of this online declaration system now, which is relatively, relatively new, it's been three, four years now, five years maybe. Even. Um, so it, it might be a very different wording and structure to the business scope, but ultimately it still helps with your research, okay? I always recommend doing this. I think it's great to look at three to four of your competitors, whether they're local domestic companies or foreign invested companies and see what they're doing. What is in their business scope? What are they allowed and permitted to do? It's not hard as long as their company registration is publicly opened, publicly filed, which most are. Um, you can go in with the Chinese name of the company and the location and get the details of, of what's inside their business scope. It's also interesting because you can look at their investment capital, who's in the corporate management, what's the exact address, et cetera. A lot of insight can be gained on how they're physically operating in the market based on what's on their business license. The next is thinking about your own scope, making it as broad as possible, right? Although remembering that there might be certain limitations and being prepared that the AIC will amend, adapt, downsize your original business scope that you did in the online declaration, okay? So what we always say is we do the online declaration, we fill as much as we can, although there is a word count limit. And if something needs to still be added or amended, we do that when we file the original applications and we make a note saying we wanna amend the business scope to add X, Y, Z, or to reword a certain activity, et cetera. Okay. And just remember that if you are applying for other licenses like food and beverage, accounting, um, or uh, internet retail, retail, there will be additional criteria that you have to fulfill and additional paperwork that will have to be submitted. Okay, so you have to get that listing as well in terms of what those criteria are. Decision two is around the capital investment and the term of validity. Okay. Now, when you are establishing your company in China, there are two numbers which the COC, which is the Ministry of Commerce, want to see. One is the total investment amount and one is the registered capital amount. Now, the total investment account, although you're not supposed to be submitting it anymore under the new foreign investment law, it is still a requirement in the online declaration and in the articles of association. So I still put it in my presentations. The registered capital is the actual capital you are going to be utilizing in China to pay off your expenses. So it's your working capital. It's the money transferred from the shareholder into the bank account and you're using that to pay salaries, rent, suppliers, whomever, okay? The total investment is a ratio against the registered capital amount, which gives you what I call the foreign debt loan, which is, I call it actually more emergency funds. The technical word is foreign debt loan. I call it emergency funds. Um, and if your capital is under 500,000 USD, then the ratio is seven to 10, seven to registered capital, 10 to the total. Okay. There are no minimum capital requirements in China. So the lowest that I've established a company has been 50,000 RMB. Um, but that's 
why did we why did that company invest that low because revenue was going to be generated within the first month so they knew that they would have that revenue to pay off expenses they also took into account delays on payment um, so they were able to sustain their company without worrying about cash flow it is important to reflect on your cash flow all right when are you going to be cash flow positive is the registered capital going to be enough to sustain your business so that salaries will be paid on time, rent will be paid on time, suppliers will be paid on time, everybody will be paid on time, and that there are no delays. Analyzing your cash flow status is something, some, blah, blah, something that nobody does. Unfortunately, it's something that I would highly recommend because it will dictate how much capital you actually need. It will give you a reflection on how much you're spending each month, how much money you actually need each month. Um, and it's, to, it's important to do that prior to establishing your company, all right? So I recommend doing a budget. I recommend doing a cash flow analysis so you know how much you're spending each month. You can almost do that in one Excel sheet. Um, so you can do a budget month to month, basically. Um, and that will give you an essence of what registered capital you should be inputting, how much total investment capital you might need for the whole project that you're establishing in China. Um, and it will also give you an idea that things are not necessarily cheap in China, right? Rents are getting, especially in places like Shanghai, rents are going up, salaries are going up. It is not the cheap nation that one thought about 20 years ago, okay? So it's important to create that. And that's why I've created the webinar for tomorrow, which is going to be evolved around budgeting, what you need to take into consideration for that and how to create your budget as well to then come to a number where you can input the registered capital amount, okay? There is no point in setting up a company in China if you don't have the financial resources backing up that company. And you need to know whether you have those financial resources on hand and whether your shareholding company has the financial resources to be able to establish that company. So it's not a quick decision that can be made. It's not that you say, you know what, I don't, there's no minimum requirement for the registered capital. So I'm just going to say 10,000 RMB. Well, that's your working capital. That's the money you're going to actually use because money doesn't freely go from UK to China, Hong Kong to China, right? There are, you have to get things approved. You have to get things um, registered. Um, it, it's, just, it's not just an easy transfer here and there, okay? And that's something that people really have to take into mind. So the action plan to calculate your registered capital. Now, I've put here a statement, which I don't always like to put in because it confuses people, but I want people to understand that the Ministry of Commerce and the Tax Bureau, they like to see companies that are, gonna that are going to indicate a registered capital of more than 1 million RMB. By like, it just means your approval goes a little bit faster, um, less questions are being raised. Um, they like to see that you've got substantive capital going into the company. When we did the application for the 50,000 round B, there was a lot of questions being asked. They didn't ask to see a financial plan, but they did have questions saying, you know, can you sustain the company with 50,000 round B until revenue comes in? And when we said, yes, contracts are already being drafted and will be signed as soon as the business license is issued, um, then they felt secure. But you know, this adds to the timeline for the incorporation, this back and forth discussion. No business plan, no financial plan has to be submitted to the government, but questions may be raised. And again, in order to know how much registered capital you, can, you need, you, you actually need we do recommend that you create a budget, right? Look at the three to five year projection and understand how much money you actually need to operate in the Chinese market. When does the capital have to be injected? So this is a big concern. So if you are going to invest 1 million RMB, when does that 1 million RMB have to actually physically go into the account? So the term of validity of a company in China owned by a foreign investor is a minimum of 10 years and a maximum of 50 years. The registered capital will go in based on the term of validity that you've chosen. If you've chosen 50 years, you have 50 years to put in that 1 million RMB. 
Okay. Six months prior to the expiration of the validity, you have to go through a renewal process for your company, which is almost like setting up fresh again. Okay. Um, but you basically have 50 years to put that in. All right. If you choose 10 years, then it's within 10 years that you are injecting that capital. <clears throat> There's no right or wrong on the, on the, on the timeline. This is completely a decision that should be made by you um, and based on the amount of capital you're going to be investing. If you're telling me that your project in China is going to be 50 million USD, you know, then choose 50 years. And it's, you're investing 1 million RMB per year. Okay? If you're issuing um, uh, 50,000 RMB as registered capital, I mean, you're going to do that in one payment, basically. Right? So understand when those payments are going to be made, when is the capital going to be needed. And again, you need to have vision and foresight into what you're planning on doing in the Chinese market to know when that's going to be coming in. So you're going to know how much capital you need today, how much will you need in five years, how much will you need in 10 years if you're planning on expanding and upscaling your business. So that's step one. Step two is around the people, all right? So step two, uh, so decision three is around who's going to be the shareholder. Will it be an individual? Will it be a company? Again, there's no real pros and cons. My suggestion here though would be, oops, would be to do a tax optimization simulation to know um, what is better. If the individual sells the company in five, 10 years, what are gonna be the tax uh, uh, liabilities on this individual in their home jurisdiction or wherever they're residing and, and, and in China? It's company, the same. What are the tax issues if you decide to sell your company? Um, uh, if you decide to add investors, if you, you've got to make a simulation to understand what is right for you, okay? Um, if you are from the UK, you should be talking to a UK tax advisor. If you're from the US, a US tax advisor to know exactly how this should all be structured. Again, there's no right or wrong. My philosophy is just from a liability perspective. I would not want to invest as an individual in a company in China. I would rather have a company that is uh, doing that on my behalf. So I'm a shareholder of a company and that company is then investing into the, into the China subsidiary. That's just purely from a corporate governance liability perspective, but you still have to look at the tax optimization component. Do you need to consider having an offshore holding company? So if your organization is larger in size, right? Um, do you think about having an intermediary holding company holding that China subsidiary? Okay. Again, here, there are three things that the government is going to be looking at. One is the double taxation agreements and whether that intermediary holding company has commercial and economic substance. Meaning, does that company um, actually operate, right? <clears throat> the other is, does it hold indirect, uh, does it hold assets? Will it hold assets? And the third is, what's the place of effective management of the Chinese company? Okay, so this is what the Chinese tax authorities are going to be looking at when you're repatriating funds back to the shareholding company, which if you choose to have an offshore holding company, they will look at these three things. Now, there are certain, blah, 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 blah. There are certain jurisdictions where um, it's just blatantly clear you're doing this for tax evasion versus tax optimization. So places like Isle of Man, Guernsey, Seychelles, British Virgin Islands, et cetera. Those, those entities won't be operational. They're purely holding structures and you're doing it to evade taxes, right? If you can show substance, uh, both economic and commercial behind them, then obviously you have a better chance of success in getting the double taxation agreement rates implemented, okay? Um, nowadays, if you look at most of the double taxation agreements, the UK, I'm, I'm, I'm voicing the majority, UK, most of the EU, Hong Kong, Singapore, have very similar rates, almost identical. So I would not set up an offshore holding company if you're doing it purely for tax reasons, because you're gonna get the same rates, whether it's Hong Kong, whether it's the UK, whether it's Germany, whether it's Ireland, it's, it's the same, okay? Uh, where the dividends tax rate is at 5% and it's unified. So, you know, really analyze whether this makes sense for your business or not. 
And another thing that I want to reiterate about having an offshore holding company is analyze the cost of operating and maintaining that offshore holding company before you even start making profit where you're going to repatriate dividends. Okay. Doesn't make sense to do that if, if, if you know, it's going to take that long. Um, what about the gateway to China, Hong Kong? You know, historically, everybody used Hong Kong to set up their businesses into China. Hong Kong was always the holding company jurisdiction. Again, as I said previously, I don't see it as an advantage if you're only using Hong Kong as an intermediary with no substance allocated whatsoever. If you're using Hong Kong for other reasons, like it's gonna become a regional hub for Asia, you're gonna have staff locally based in Hong Kong, there's gonna be transactions running through the Hong Kong company, that's another story, okay? Then it might make sense to consolidate China as a subsidiary of Hong Kong, especially if you're expanding into the Asian region, okay? But then you're not just looking at China, you're looking at Asia. Now, I hope you guys can already see, just by decision three, you are really looking at the vision of what you're doing, not just in China, but in Asia as a whole, to make sure your structure that you're developing is the right fit. Because you're just going to spend more money later on if changes are going to be made. Okay. Now, decision four is on corporate management in China, which I'm going to be touching on again in a presentation later this week, where I don't, so I don't want to go into too much depth, but basically when you're setting up your company in China, you've got two types of corporate management structures you can have. The one on the left has a board of directors. The one on the right has an executive director. That's the only difference, okay? Board of directors has to be a minimum of three people, executive director is one person. Ultimately on the left with the board of directors, you need to have four people appointed at minimum, three board members, Chairman is usually the legal rep and GM, and then you have a supervisor who's somebody different, so four people. On the right, you have, and I'm simplifying this, guys, right? On the right, you've got the executive director, who's one person. He's also, or she is also the legal rep. He or she is also the general manager. And then you've got the supervisor separate from that, okay? Um, again, I don't wanna go into too much detail about that because in the end of the day, um, I'll be going through that in more detail in a webinar later on this week. Um, allocating power and mitigating risk, that's always a big question that's being asked, right? Uh, for newcomers in China, right? De delegating power always requires a degree of trust. So, you know, I wouldn't appoint people that I've only just recruited to be in those roles. You might be different. If you do do that, I hope that you're going to implement certain measures to protect yourself, to protect the Chinese subsidiary and to protect your headquarter in case there's a falling out with that newly recruited individual, all right? So um, again, delegating power requires a degree of trust. Make sure you've got that trust in place. Make sure you've got that loyalty in place um, and just implement certain measures to protect your business. Okay, so I'm referencing now the company chops, right? There are a variety of different chops that are produced in China. The chops are extremely important because any contract is signed with a chop, not signature. It's, it's verified by the chop. Whoever holds the chops has power of authority on doing your business, on creating new contracts, on signing off on contracts, um, that you've got to know who's going to hold them, who's going to operate them, do you trust them? Will you have a logbook to verify how they're being used? What will you be doing? So in terms of decision number, th uh, decision number four around the corporate management structure, I've listed a couple of questions for you to, for you to answer about who you're gonna appoint, all right? Simple questions. Who or what is making the investment to China as an individual or a company? Who's going to be the ultimate decision maker? Who's going to be the CFO finance manager? Who will be the bank signatory or who will be approving payments? Who will keep control of the company chops? The list can go on. Who's going to keep the contracts, labor contracts, business contracts, uh, et cetera. From the shareholder, who is the authorized signatory? Will you have one? Will you have several? Do you choose a board of directors or an executive director? What's going to be... Uh, proper for your organization, what's going to make things more efficient operationally. Um, who will you appoint? 
as an executive director or, as, or within the board, who will be the legal rep, the GM, and the supervisor? Now, in many instances, people want to know what are the responsibilities, what are the liabilities? Again, I will go into that in more detail in, in the presentation later this week. Step three is looking at location. And under location, we're going to look at company name as well as the registered office address. And many of you might be wondering, well, why are we looking at the company name? Well, it's because the company name holds the place of where you're establishing your business. So decision five is around the company name for the Chinese subsidiary. So your company name reflects everything that you stand for when you go into the market, okay? It's the first thing that people are going to associate you with, okay? In China, the company name registration process requires that the name adheres to certain stipulations, okay? The most critical point that you have to realize is that if you register in a place like Shanghai, Beijing, Guangzhou, Shenzhen, there are thousands of companies that are being registered on a daily basis. To, so to find the right name that is available is extremely difficult. In the uh, industry sector activity that you're planning on doing in the Chinese market, okay? So, the structure of the company name is going to be company name plus business type plus the city where you're establishing and then company limited. Okay. Now I've put this in English because I'm referring this to foreign investors so that they understand what it means. So for example, Woodburn is, if I do the translation into English, is Woodburn Management Consulting Shanghai Company Limited because we're, a managed, we're considered as a management consulting firm. Okay. The company name in Chinese should be between two and four characters. So to find that within the business type can be very difficult. This is why it's important to do the business scope first, to analyze what activity are you guys going to be performing so that we can know what business type will be under the name and where we can then see if there are choices where the name that's your highest priority is available. That might have sounded a bit confusing. Let me just reiterate that again. Let's say you have a favorite two to four character Chinese name. You love it. It's going to give you a lot of feng shui. Um, you have a business type based on the activities and the business scope. Um, but in that business type, it doesn't, it's not available. But if we tweak that business type slightly, it will be available. Okay. So we've got to work with that. City of formation is something like Shanghai, Guangzhou, Beijing, Wuhan, Ningbo, right? It depends on where you're establishing your company and where the registered office address is going to be. And then you've got company limited. Um, when you're registering your company, only the Chinese name is registered. Although once you have your company, you issue your company shop, you can put both the English and the Chinese name on there. Okay. So questions to ask your management about the China operations is, how important is the Chinese name to you? For Woodburn, it's not important. We don't use it for marketing or branding. We only use Woodburn. As such, we were not so um, picky about our Chinese name when we did. But however, when we did do the little literal translation of Woodburn, we realized that it was very, very unlucky. Um, in fact, quite bad because uh, burning has a, has, a, has a bad connotation in China that we then chose a Chinese name that is not even by pronunciation nor by literal meaning Woodburn, okay? But we don't mind because the only place that you ever see our Chinese name is on our fob gowns, and that's it. Because um, even our contracts are in English language. So you've got to analyze how important is that Chinese name to you? And then you've got to look at two other things, which is what is going to be your trademark registration in China? So what are you registering as your brand name? What's going to be your marketing name versus your domain? If you register also your domain in China, okay? Versus what is then the Chinese company name? It could very well be, because these are three very separate applications, that your trademark name is different from your domain name is different from your Chinese company name. Because it's just not available, okay? So you've got to look at that analysis as well and, and look at that key decision prior to doing anything with your company establishment, okay? You've got to analyze whether your Chinese name is an important aspect to your image. Um, 
and your brand reputation. Okay, so as a strategy, only the Chinese language is language name is going to be registered. The company name must be different from any other company that's registered in that business activity in that city that you're being registered in. There are two approaches. You can take a descriptive name or you can take a name that has absolutely no meaning and you just do it by pronunciation, by literal sound of your English company name, for example. Um, we always recommend to get a native speaker to get involved in that to make sure also there's a sense of good luck behind the name. There are media agencies that do this type of work where they look at the strategy of what you're looking to do in China and try to create a Chinese name with what activity you're trying to perform. And they can also do the checks together with companies like ourselves about the trademark domain and then the company name registration. We always recommend to try and get at least three to five top names um, done so that in case at the point of registration, it's already taken, which can happen, um, that you've got backup plans. Remember, analyze. I, I, I really push this and emphasize this. Analyze Chinese company name against trademark registration against domain registration. Decision six is you need to sign a lease agreement for a registered office address. Okay. And again, on Wednesday, I'm going to be going into great length about this because this is a big issue amongst foreign investors. So let me just touch very briefly on the legal consequences of selecting a location in China. A registered office address is a must for a company registration. As I mentioned with the document list, there are four documents that are needed from your landlord in regards to the registered office address. Okay. In addition, the registered office address should be your operational office. Virtual office addresses are illegal in China. If it is found out you're, if by your bank, your bank can, can freeze your accounts, which has happened to a client of mine, or you can get into trouble through random government inspections that may happen at your office location. So be aware of that. You need to sign at least a one-year lease agreement um, any agreement that is shorter than one year will be rejected and denied during the application procedure, and they will ask you to sign, re sign the lease so that it's valid for 12 months. So it is important that when you're doing your registration, that you've got your lease just recently signed. Type of property is of utmost importance because it has to match the business scope, i.e. the activities that you have chosen. So not that you choose a retail shop and you're doing manufacturing in it. Okay. Not that you choose a commercial space and you're doing manufacturing in it. Even simple assembly is considered manufacturing, which means it should be in a warehouse or factory location and not in a commercial space. So again, the type of property has to match the activities you're looking to perform. And that, because on the, uh, um, when you purchase a property, the, um, I forget what it's called now, this document, um, that shows proof of the purchase that you are the owner. The ownership certificate of the property has a section which says type of property, right? And they'll say residential, commercial, uh, et cetera, industrial. And um, I just want to highlight here, you won't see residential anywhere because you're not allowed to set up your company in any residential facility, okay? The key is remembering that unlike other jurisdictions, only one company can be registered in one registered office space. Okay, so if you've got um, a commercial building and you look at the fifth floor and you see that there's office 501, 502, 503, 504, 505, only one company can be registered in each of those offices. Okay, so when you're leasing a space, you also have to make sure that the previous tenant has been taken off um, at, the, at the real estate bureau's um, office so that you are able to go in. Otherwise that can also cause delays in the registration of the company. If you are suddenly realizing that the location you've chosen is not a success for your business and you wanna change cities, I almost wanna to say tough luck, <laughs> um, but that probably wouldn't be appropriate. If you, for example, choose to set up your company in Shanghai and you realize that Shanghai was the worst decision ever because uh, what you're finding is that the better employees are in Beijing and your customers are in Beijing or the Beijing area. 
and you should have set up your company up there. You can't just pick up your company and say, okay, I take it from Shanghai to Beijing. It's two governmental cities. So you'd have to liquidate your Shanghai company and open fresh in Beijing. Or another option is set up a branch company of your Shanghai company, but maintain that Shanghai company. Um, and then just open up the branch in Beijing. It is important to choose your location wisely and make sure you are choosing the right city for the right reasons and stick to that city. Tax consequences around the registered office address. So when you are establishing your company, and again, I'll go in this in much greater detail on, on Wednesday. Each city in China is made up of districts, okay? And so let's say you choose Shanghai. In Shanghai, there are 11 districts. So that means there are 11 tax bureaus because there's a tax bureau appointed in each district. You're registering your company in that city, but you're registering your tax status within that district that you've chosen. So again, if you've chosen Shanghai, um, you have Luan, uh, you don't have Luan. You have Huangpu district, you have Chaning district, you've got Jing'an district, you've got Pudong district. If you choose one of those districts, you are registered at that tax office. Okay. You have to analyze the tax incentives that are being offered, state, local, or district. Make sure you've gotten these tax incentives written down. Make sure you understand them. Make sure you understand when they will be applicable to you because everybody is concerned about profits tax, but how long will it take for you to be profitable in China? It does not happen overnight. So what's the point of going to a city that offers a tax incentive that's valid today, but might not be valid in five years when actually you start becoming profitable? And nobody can guarantee you whether those tax incentives from today will be valid in five years. So again, the budget is critical because you need to analyze when you're gonna become profitable and when these tax incentives will become applicable to you, whether that's profits tax, VAT, individual income tax, whatever it might be. And make sure you get all of these tax incentives written down, signed off on. Should you wish to change office space and move to another? So let's say you're happy with Shanghai, but you want to move from Chunning District to Pudong District. You've got to understand what the tax consequences are. Okay. So if you are in Chunning District, you will have to do a tax closure audit before you can reopen your tax status in the Pudong District when you move offices. This could mean up to three months of um, the inability to issue FAPIAOs and invoices. It means almost three months of a halt in your business to go through that tax closure audit to then reopen in the new district. It is old fashioned, it is old school, okay? The new district is always gonna be happy to take you because their goal is to increase their tax revenue. The old district where you're closing the status is not going to be happy with you. So they will go through a thorough tax closure audit to make sure you have no outstanding liabilities because they want to earn every penny off of you in terms of your tax revenue. Okay, it is a pain. It's a painful process. So this is why it's not only important to find the right city, it's also really important to find the right district where you see yourself growing in that district. Because ideally you want to stay in that same district. Um, action plan. If you are new setting up a company and you are analyzing right now what your registered office address should be, obviously you need to analyze city and district, but then also analyze whether it's better to be in a business center versus an operational office. What is the right location to be in for you? Um, I like business centers because it's an easy startup where you then have the ability to move into a proper operational office in the same district ideally, so that you don't have to do a tax closure audit. Um, but it's important to analyze that and, and analyze basically, you know, how you see your, your company growing in the market. Okay, step four, which is the final step, which is finance. So decision seven is bank, and I'll be talking about banks on Friday in depth. But very briefly, when you're incorporating your company in China, do your homework. Which bank do you choose? Please don't let your corporate service provider choose it for you. I can make recommendations that in many instances will be biased because of my own experiences. 
But in the end, you should talk yourself to two or three different banks to have your own conclusion over what is the right bank for you. Don't let anybody else choose on your behalf. Again, like I said, I can make recommendations, but it's not me who is going to be formulating a relationship with the bank. I already have my own. You need to formulate that relationship because your lawyer, your agent, your corporate service provider is not going to be around forever. Ideally, at some point, you're going to become independent and you need to collaborate with this bank yourself. And this is a big mistake that companies make is they rely on whoever they're using to set up their company to make that choice for them versus actually doing their own homework and analyzing what would be the right bank, All right? When you're doing that analysis and having those conversations with the banks, obtain the document list, understand what's required. Your agent is gonna be doing all of that work for you, but it's important that you understand it as well. Again, this is the start of a relationship with your bank, okay? Now, over, under COVID-19, some cities, are okay with Zoom conference calls, where the legal representative, who's ever, whoever, whomever is appointed as the legal representative, shows their original passport with their picture page and has to follow a um, dialogue indicating, yes, I want to open a bank account for my company called XYZ on this date, please open it today, okay? Um, however, in places like Shenzhen, the bank, even with COVID and even with quarantine regulations, still wants to meet the legal representative in person with the original passport to open the account, which is why many companies that are looking to set up in Shenzhen are unable to set up because either they don't have people on the ground that can hold the legal rep role or they themselves refuse to do the, the, the 14 to 21 day quarantine um, that is required for a two hour visit at the bank to open the account, okay? Point five is critical. It's been one year now. The bank is required by the People's Bank of China to visit the registered office address to prove that it is not a virtual office location. I'll let that sink in. So not only is your corporate service provider telling you that you're not allowed a virtual office, but the banks are actually checking that you're not going into a virtual office space. All right. Now the whole process, again, takes between 25 and 30 working days. A lot of this will depend on the back end fourth information, signing of documents, the video, um, and also the availability of the bank to have that in-person meeting to submit the documents and the availability of the bank to do the on-site visit at the registered office address, okay? Just so you know, if you have an office in a business center and you have an actual office space, there are absolutely no problems with, with these uh, visits. Um, if you do, though, choose to have the virtual office location and it's at a business center, you might run into difficulties unless your business center has the ability to talk to the bank about it and, um, and bank approves. Just remember, up to point five, you get then your B account, basic account numbers, you get your capital account numbers, but then you need to set up your online banking operation. So that's outside of the 25 to 30 working days. Um, and usually that will take about 10 working days. Then the capital is remitted to the shareholder um, into the capital account. Sorry, the capital is remitted from the shareholder into the capital account. Um, it is not able to transfer into the RMB basic account until a certain period of months where you have to show contracts and invoices of things that have to get paid. Those will all be paid from the capital account until the point where the bank says usually takes three to four months. The bank says, okay, I see that you've got recurring expenses. You can now transfer into the RMB basic account. Um, so it, it's not all easy going because you have to show all of these documents in original. Um, initially, it can be done by courier. That's been a nice new initiative through COVID um, that you can send things by courier now versus doing actual original face-to-face -face bank visits. Um, it helps to save a lot of time but uh, it is a bit of a pain that it can't be automatically transferred into the RMB basic account. And again, I'm gonna emphasize it again on this page. The account opening process should not determine who your banking partner is, okay? The partnership, this partnership, this banking partnership will last for the full validity of your organization. So choose your bank wisely, speak with them, before you actually go through this whole process of incorporating your, your bank accounts 
um, and, and just start a relationship with them. Understand what their capabilities are. Do you need financing capabilities? Well, find out if the bank can offer that to you. Or if not, what are the criteria? Do you need credit cards or debit cards for your company? Well, if yes, then talk to the bank about their capabilities and you know, what are the criteria to obtain those. Understand what is the criteria you need from the bank as well and have those conversations. If you were to open a company in the US or in the UK, you would be talking to a multiple multitude of banks to understand what they can offer you in terms of facilities. And there's so many foreign investors who don't do that in China because they rely on their corporate service provider to make that decision on their behalf. It's wrong. You need to know what you need from your bank and have those discussions. And if they don't speak English and they're not the right bank for you, choose another bank, right? Understand what you need from them. Decision eight is around the value added tax status. And this is important because this has to be dictated. If you remember the processes timeline in the post registration, there was tax registration after the bank account opening, that has to be decided upon at that time. So it's important to under make that decision prior to the incorporation. So VAT is a little bit of a complex situation in China. Um, I've got a couple of slides here, but I just want to summarize. Um, there are two types of value, uh, VAT statuses. One is a general VAT taxpayer and one is a small scale taxpayer. As an action plan, evaluate. At one point, are you going to be doing domestic business? At one point, are you going to be issuing fob cows to customers? And analyze what type of costs you are actually going to have. Because it might make sense as a tax optimization structure to remain as a small scale taxpayer for a certain period of time until you really start um, developing your business where you can then upgrade yourself to a general VAT taxpayer. If you become a general VAT taxpayer from day one, you um, will have more tax liability if you have no business running through it than if you remain as a small scale taxpayer. And the issue is, is you cannot downgrade from general VAT to small scale, you can only upgrade from small scale to general VAT or remain as a general VAT taxpayer. So that's the decision that has to be made. My recommendation again is look at your budget, understand what revenues are going to be generated and at what point, look at your costs and create certain simulations to understand what makes sense for you. And again, you know, uh, your corporate service provider or lawyer should be doing these simulations so you know exactly what status you should be maintaining from day one. Decision nine is around the appointment of the finance manager. So the finance manager is not part of the corporate management structure, but the finance manager um, together with the tax agent, I rolled the two in one, has to be appointed at this tax meeting, uh, at this uh, tax registration meeting together with what is your general VA, what, what is your VAT status. So the important thing that you need to understand prior to incorporating is, are you gonna do a recruitment of an in-house accountant or are you going to be outsourcing the accounting? And therefore your outsource provider will provide this person or will you go through the recruitment and this person will be appointed here, okay? There are pros and cons to outsourcing and keeping things in the house. Just a brief list here is analyze the cost, salary versus the cost of the provider. Look at the talent pool. Look at, you know, do you wanna deal with recruitment? Right now you can't travel to China. Do you want to do the recruitment process over Zoom? How, how, how would that work? Look at the focus and specialization of these individuals. If you are recruiting them, do they have the skill set that you need in terms of an accountant um, versus outsourcing it? And again, look at language and culture. Um, for some reason, uh, and I don't understand the mindset on this, uh, people hire accountants who don't speak English or have very limited English capabilities or speak a good English, but when it comes to technical issues around the finance, cannot explain clearly and transparently. So finance is technical and you need to have people that have the ability to communicate with your own CFOs and decision makers. Um, and if that means outsourcing it, then outsource it until you find the right person for that role. Um, the disadvantages are a little bit looking again back to costs, 
what's more expensive, what's not more expensive, looking at talent, and obviously the other side of recruiting, uh, which it can be painful to find the right people and very, very time consuming. So that's the China Incorporation blueprint. Again, like I said, there are four steps, structure, people, location, finance, nine key considerations that are really important prior to establishing your entity. Um, I'd love to know what was your biggest takeaway from today. Again, there were not so many people on today, so I'll probably skip that for today. But just to recap, how can you work with me? Well, we do incorporation advisory. We do the actual incorporations in China. We can do the competitor business scope benchmarking, as I mentioned earlier. We can appoint supervisors, finance managers, and non-executive directors. We do tax advisory. So for example, we do the VAT simulations. And then of course you can outsource the accounting tax payroll and compliance work to us as well. Um, if you're interested in booking a session, my details are here. Um, uh, again, the easiest way to reach me is at Christina at woodburnglobal.com. Don't hesitate to reach out. Um, and just remember, we have three more sessions, of course, sorry, four more sessions where we're going to take an in-depth look at four of the key topics that I spoke about today. One is, is the budget and capital. One is the registered office address. One is looking at the corporate management. And the last one is looking at the bank account. All right. So if you haven't registered for those, you can go to woodburnglobal.com slash events and, um, and register there. And I hope you'll join us because um, it is a lot of very interesting and detailed information that will help you to make your decisions um, around, around those four topics. I hope this has been helpful to you. Um, again, if you've got any questions, please type them in. Nothing has popped in thus far, um, but I will stay on for another five minutes if you do have any um, outstanding questions. Um, I hope you have a great day. Take care and goodbye.